Admittedly, we've only done this once before, but I might. <laughs> so, um, I'm John Mooney, uh, founding editor of NJ Spotlight. And I, I welcome you here today, and, and thank you very much for joining us. It's a, a very exciting time. Oh, I'll take it. It's a very exciting time for, uh, for NJ Spotlight, but we also hope it's a, a really exciting time for the state and, and its cities, which is really the core mission of being here today. Um, obviously, it's a lot's going on in this country right now, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty of what comes next. But certainly for New Jersey, uh, we're really entering a, a critical time where we're going to be electing a new governor in a year, and uh, a lot of major issues facing the state, and particularly its cities. And it's one of the reasons, it's a big reason why NJ Spotlight has focused its conference every year, two years, uh, on, on the urban issues facing us. Um, I will say NJ Spotlight itself is also at a crossroads. We started six years ago now uh, as a small little startup, the four of us. Uh, and we have grown you know, to what I hope you all feel is a very respected and incredible news source for the state. I have a little bit of, yes, I, I'm told to hurry along, but I do stop for applause, so that's fine. Um, I do, with this captive audience in mind, uh, a little shameless marketing um, is allowed, but I, I wanted to share with you all that um, as we've grown, one of the big things that we're going to be doing in the next year is reaching out to all of you and others uh, to start a membership program, um, and, and really both to gain support for ourselves but also to build the, the uh, community that we know is in this room and, and throughout the state. Um, our content will remain free. Don't want anyone worry about that. We're, we're still a free news site, but in that way we can really uh, engage folks and give them some voice. So uh, watch for that in your emails. We all know where, we know where you live and work, uh, so we'll, we'll be coming to you, um, but please join us uh, in this community. Let's talk about today. Uh, it's a great, uh, amazing program, I think. Um, obviously, uh, the main theme is about starting to talk about an urban agenda for the state as we go into next year's election, um, and especially raising the profile of cities uh, around that. Uh, leading off, and we'll be starting in a moment, we have uh, Newark Mayor Ross Baraka and former Governor Kane, who are going to bring their perspectives to it. And at the end of the day, we have a bunch of the gubernatorial candidates who uh, we will start getting them on record. Uh, and then we are journalists, after all, uh, getting them on record on some of these key issues facing us. Um, but in between, we have panels and, and um, talks. And we, if you were here with us last year, we do these mini TED Talks of sorts, these little quick hits. And I think they're all great. Look at your s schedule. I'm not going to go through them. Uh, for time, but, but it's, I think, a really compelling day, and, and we hope you can join us as long as possible. There's one change that's not in your schedule. Um, at the end of the, uh, Matt Lister, who's speaking about designing public spaces, will be talking at the end of the day at 3.30. Wonderful talk, uh, and he won't be at 11, he'll be at 3.30. I also want to highlight uh, that at 2 o'clock today, we're going to have a session in this room, an interactive session where we ask conferees to, to to share what they think we should be talking about uh, around our cities. No panels, we'll have a wonderful facilitator, but it's an opportunity for you all to share. All of this is um, gonna be reported on. This event itself, as we speak, is, is being live streamed. This, this first talk in the end of the day is being live streamed. What's, you know, of course, what's an event these days without a hashtag, NJSO on, uh, NJS on cities? Um, but I just think it's gonna be great, and we're, we're really excited. Lots of thanks to go around. Uh, NJ Spotlight's team, led by Lee Keo, our editor-in-chief. Uh, NJ Spotlight's board, led by Ingrid Reed. I hope she's, there she is. Um, and I just think that, you know, it takes many people to do this. And, and the one person I really want to highlight is Paula Saha, our audience development director, who really pulled it all together. And she's in the back. And it doesn't happen without our sponsors. Uh, and I want to highlight a, a couple of them. Robert Wood Johnson, Barnabas Health, uh, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the Walton Family Foundation, Thomas Edison State University, and the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation. Uh, they've been a longtime friend of ours from practically the beginning, and, and our, their support is much appreciated and treasured. And I wanted to offer Marco Navarro, a senior program officer, a few, a few minutes to, to say a few words, and then we'll get the program started. Marco? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
This, uh, uh, for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, this event's really uh, important for many reasons. And I just want to offer a couple of reasons and, and say more about the foundation. Uh, first, this is all about New Jersey, which is a good thing in and of itself, right? Uh, and the foundation uh, has a long-standing commitment to New Jersey. We were uh, established here in 1972. And since that time, we've invested almost a billion dollars in a variety of programs that really are meant to de designed to improve the health, uh, life chances, and well-being of people. A couple of things I want to just offer you, just to share by uh, example. So one of the foundation's uh, directions now is to build a culture of health. That's a very bold, ambitious uh, undertaking. And what it really means is that all of us, no matter who we are, or where we live, ought to be able to have a healthy and productive life. That's pretty bold, right? And so this is uh, something we're going to do around the country, and our commitment to New Jersey is also a part of that. But what does that really mean? It means that we need to think about uh, creating um, uh, people coming together and embracing this notion that health is a shared value, it's something we can all rally around. It's a foundation, it's a platform to build healthier communities. So by way of example, quickly, right now we're supporting uh, 20 cross-sector collaborations around the, around the state who are coming together and are addressing these social and economic determinants of health. These are the issues that really drive our, our health and well-being outside, in fact, the healthcare system. But it's also important that, to make sure that we connect our work in New Jersey to our national efforts. So, for example, the city of Patterson is now part of a, selected as one of 50 communities around the country to, to participate in a, in a group called, uh, a program called Invest Health. Invest Health is looking at population uh, improvement by looking at economic development. So through grants and, and, and technical assistance and other support, the community leaders here are going to organize around what that means. It could mean, for example, building a new supermarket or, grocery or uh, affordable housing. Those are the kinds of things that improve communities and add to the residents as well. So uh, that's one reason why I want to be here and think it's a great event. The second reason I wanted to offer is that, um, in many ways, our discussion here today is about building a culture of health. Whether we're talking about affordable housing or quality uh, child care or transportation, it's all about, it's all connected to our health and well-being. So that's important that we think about that. And um, the third reason, quickly, think about who's in this room today. It's amazing, a combination of uh, government leaders and state uh, and business leaders, those from uh, other sectors, uh, urban planning, uh, transportation. Um, this is what it takes to build a culture of health. Having us all be in this room, uh, sharing ideas, uh, lessons learned, and thinking about how we can magnify our work going forward. So it's about uh, you know, advocates and, and leaders and innovators who are coming together in one way or another to really improve the, the health and well-being of, 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 of our population. It's about making sure that we, um, we build not only a healthy, uh, not only affordable and fair housing, but safe and clean. It's about making sure we, we develop transportation systems that move not just cars, but move people in a very convenient way. It's that we strive to create jobs that pay well and allow families to thrive. We support uh, programs that help kids, young, young children, be able to get a healthy start in life and succeed. It's about making sure that we invest in our streets and our sidewalks. We have access to uh, open spaces, parks, and playgrounds we can enjoy with our families. We also have access to basic things like, like a local grocery store that allows us to buy uh, healthier foods, if that's what we want to do, right? So uh, going forward, I think uh, we're looking to uh, collaborate with everyone here in New Jersey as together we go about creating a culture of health, one community at a time, in our great state of New Jersey. So I, I look forward to the discussion this afternoon. I, I guess I also encourage you to think about, think about how can we work together? How can we leverage our resources, our creativity, our knowledge of the state in order to make New Jersey a healthier place to live, to learn, to work, and to play? So thank you for listening. I look forward to the conference. All right. Here we go. Just right on time, of course. Um, because we are running a little late, um, we, we will implore you at the end of this, uh, not much of a break to the next session. So please move on quickly to that, because we want to slowly try to catch up. So I'd like to introduce our guests of honor, our co-keynotes of sorts. Um, to come up to the stage, uh, Mayor Roz Baraka, who I initially met as uh, the principal of uh, Central High School a few years back when I was covering education for the Ledger. Uh, obviously also, yep. 
elected mayor in 2014, and Governor Kane, uh, two-term governor in 1980s, and of course, uh, chairman of the 9-11 um, commission after uh, September 11th, but he's become a good friend of ours as well, and when I mentioned to him the idea of, of having this conversation, uh, being the former history teacher that he is, uh, let's just say we talked for a while. Um, so I'm gonna join them here. Is this okay? All right. Fine. Um, because you're a history teacher, I, I, let me start with you a little bit. Um, one of the things we did uh, as part of this conference in, uh, was we worked with Eagleton Institute at Rutgers to do some polling about what folks thought of their cities. And if you have, it's the, the, the gist of the results are in your books. Um, and, and please take a look at it. And, and many thanks to Eagleton for its support on that. And, but it was very interesting. It was, and as I wrote, uh, it's sort of complicated. There's not a real consensus of where our cities are or where they're headed at the moment. It was fairly evenly split between them being a good place to live and, and them not being such a great place to live. And also um, the direction in the last five years, are they getting better, are they getting worse? It was fairly, um, fairly even. And, and what was interesting is we compared it to some polling Eagleton did 20, 30 years ago uh, when you were governor and it was also uh, fairly complicated. And this was coming out of you know, 10 years after or 15 years after some real tumult in our cities, obviously. Um, so uh, being, being the history teacher that you are, give us a little bit of a history of, of where the cities were uh, when you were governor and, and how much, if, if anything, uh, has changed in that time. John, I, I can go back even before that because the year I was elected to the assembly was the year of the riots. And I represented Peace of Newark. So our whole agenda for that session of the legislature was nothing but the neglect that had been for the cities and what can we do to build on that. And so we sponsored the, I sponsored the first urban aid bill ever, I wrote the Education Opportunity Fund and a whole bunch of other programs, all designed really to help people, help people in cities. But the, <laughs> but the way it's, the way it's changed since I was governor, it's changed for the better for any number of reasons. Well, I mean, look where we're sitting. Uh, this would not have been in the city when I became governor. Uh, look at the other things that are happening in cities. People are moving back in. What you've got going in this city, man, now, where actually the private sector is building buildings for people to come and live in the city, where businesses are coming into the city. And that's happening in Jersey City tremendously. Uh, it's certainly happened in New Brunswick and um, Camden. It started happening in Camden. So you see the you see the seeds starting to blossom. And with good leadership, and by the way, what I love is somebody who's an educator who loves the arts. To have that as mayor is a very special thing in Newark. <laughs> but <laughs> and what you got in addition to that is, as the urban studies people will tell you, this generation, this new millennial generation, wants to be in and around urban areas. They're starting to move back. You find a lot of houses for sale out in the country, but uh, more and more demand for people in and around cities. And I think that'll all come together with good leadership in the cities. And most importantly, there's got to be an urban policy. Uh, this next governor has got to say, this is what I want to do. And he's got to do it in consultation with the mayors. I used to meet with the mayors on a regular basis, met with the urban ministers on a regular basis to devise an urban policy and we can talk about that later if you want to, but we had an urban policy for ev every year and things we wanted to accomplish through the legislature every year to help the cities. And a lot of that urban agenda was designed by the mayors um, working with me. In the, lead, in the lead up to the tumult uh, in, in the riots, the rebellion, um, what was, was there th enough thinking about the cities? I mean, was there a political will uh, or did that or the lack thereof contribute to, to where we had you know, come at that point. Oh, I think there was, there was an awful neglect of the cities in those days. Politically as well. Yes, yeah. ab very strongly politically. And it was, uh, I don't know quite how it was allowed to develop, because in those days, maybe as opposed to now, and right through certainly my administration, uh, the leadership of one of the great parties, the Democratic Party, was a lot of it was urban-based. And we had leaders of the state, county chairman, and everything else that came out of the cities. And so there should have been, in my mind, more 
emphasis and more respect to the cities, and uh, uh, there just wasn't. I mean, I just that wasn't. Uh, it didn't seem to me it was on the agenda. Because when we, after the riots, when I worked with, uh, I was the leader of the largest delegation of legislature. Republicans had control, and so I worked very closely with the Democratic governor in those days, Dick Hughes, and we came up together with the head of Prudential <laughs> on the committee to study urban policy. We came up with, I think we had 50 or 60 bills. Well, a lot of those bills, you know, should have been done years before. Right. Exactly. I mean, they were, they were addressing things that have been neglected for cities and people in the cities. And, and uh, so, But it, I don't know what the reason was. But there just really was not an urban policy before that or any policy which paid a lot of attention to people in cities. My main job here is to get out of the way, so I may even slide back, but I, I wanted you to respond to that as a little bit, but you've been pressing to bring an urban agenda to this country, um, and um, talk a little bit about how you think we got here. You grew up in uh, a lot of the times that he's talking about, but you know, give, give me your impression of, of where our cities are now um, and, and some of these issues of, of an urban agenda and whether uh, you know, the, the attention has been paid, enough attention has been paid. Well, how we got here, um, you know, uh, I would say we are still uh, recovering from the kind of post-World War II uh, kind of movement that moved people out of the cities into the suburbs, uh, kind of subsidized, and not kind of actually subsidized movement of folks into the suburbs. Uh, the amount of mortgages that were given, uh, the, uh, the forgiveness of, of, of debt on these mortgages, financed by the government and other kinds of uh, uh, programs that allow people to actually live in suburbs, buy homes, uh, come out of the city of Newark, uh, then build highways into the city, which allow people to live in the suburbs, come to Newark uh, or places in the city to work, and then go back uh, to where they were. So it extracted the wealth uh, from those communities. Then you build high-rise projects and you concentrate people or poverty into very specific areas uh, of the city, so you never really dealt with the development of people. You just put poor people in one specific location. You had a huge migration of, of African Americans from the South, the second migration after the war. Uh, people uh, coming here looking for jobs, and later on you had uh, a Latino population, mainly from Puerto Rico, and now you know it's spread out, and uh, you have more Latinos from different parts of the world. But ultimately, uh, in 1966, the country, be, I mean, the, the city became predominantly African American a year before the rebellion. Uh, there's this narrative that after the rebellion, everybody moved out. Well, that's absolutely not the facts. Uh, people were moving out after World War II, not just physically, but economically. And, you know, the, the tax base and everything else uh, was taken away from the city. Then there was a big red line drawn around Newark and places like that. And, uh, you know, the banks refused to invest and develop in these communities. And so they were allowed to deteriorate on purpose. Uh, now the, the red line has uh, you know, been moved a little bit, at least they moved it away from the downtown area and you know, in, in <laughs> a few parts of it. So you could develop downtown, you just can't go anywhere else. And uh, so you have parts of the city with no access to uh, commerce, finance, uh, uh, food, you know, anything. You know? So it's, it's almost a desert. Uh, in, in those places, but the downtown is good. Like you said, millennials like to live uh, back. In, in fact, the country is trending back towards the cities. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the country's GDP are created in the cities. Um, people are moving into these communities, uh, you know, basically next to transportation, next to water, next to trains, next to buses, uh, and they want to be around what's happening and what's good, and uh, that's really what's bringing life back uh, to these communities, and I guess mayors around the country are trying to figure out how to parlay that, you know, and 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 use that to increase the economic growth in this in the city, fix some of the problems that that exist there, put more people in, into the universities, into the colleges, bring industry back to their communities, uh, trying to revitalize them or bring life, and it's a difficult job, you know. That's why you have the kind of mixed uh, view of what the city is, depending on where you live at in the city you will have a view of your, your perspective will be different based on where you live. Uh, obviously, if you live in the heart of, of poverty, your view is different than if you live in uh, 1180, right? So at the end of the day, uh, we are trying our best, mayors, you know, are trying our best to spread the, the wealth and the economic growth throughout uh, the community. And I've and I been saying that we need an urban Marshall Plan because... What does that mean? Well, you know, 
uh, at the end of the day, you know, when that Marshall Plan is, you know, rebuilt Europe after the war, uh, in, in, in millions of dollars, today's, you know, number would be billions of dollars invested. And that, I don't think that was ever invested uh, at that capacity in these cities. Uh, the New Deal and FDR and all of those programs came and it helped the country a great deal and moved a whole lot of people, unskilled laborers, as a matter of fact, you know, out of poverty. Uh, not people who went to school, who had these degrees, who, who had to go to f uh, financial literacy classes, who, you know, who, who, who all these things we're trying to make our people do in order for them to get the things that we think that every American deserves, uh, were given to people simply because they were human beings. Uh, uh, the, the New Deal did that. The problem with, with the New Deal was the timing. It, it helped the rest of the country, and a lot of people benefit that, but that was the heart of segregation in America. The Democratic Party was still segregated itself under, with the Dixiecrats, and uh, a lot of it missed uh, black and brown people and immigrants and other folks have never had an opportunity to really benefit in any grand way from the New Deal. And, I, and, I, and because of that, we have what we have today, and we have not had the will or the courage since then to do that again for the rest of America who was left out of the first New Deal, the, the, the Great Society and all of those uh, programs. In fact, uh, those programs began to be cut, right? Uh, because they began to help people of color. And uh, that, that needs to, somebody has to have the courage to change that and say we need to have an urban Marshall Plan, a serious investment uh, in these communities around public transportation, around infrastructure, around job training, employment, uh, unskilled and skilled labor. Uh, we need serious investment in these communities. We, we need that. And, uh, you know, without that, we're going to have a vicious cycle of what we've been seeing, 50 years of poverty, unemployment, violence, and all kinds of things that are going on in our community. Any thoughts on this? Yeah. I, 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 literally, I'm going to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the man's right, obviously, and, and, um, and everything he says historically. Uh, I remember coming to Newark. Uh, how the governor be established? We had a governor's office in Newark. Uh, also established a governor's office in Jersey City. And when we talked to people who wanted to come into New Jersey, we had a lot of jobs coming in those years. Uh, we gave them extra benefits if they were willing to locate in cities. Uh, so the state did more for them for that urban investment. As I talked to people in a city like this, I said, you know, what do you really want? Very simple. We wanted uh, safe streets because one, remember one woman telling me one time, you know, I got mugged three times because I take the bus to my job. I can walk in my apartment in the bus. I was mugged three times. Can we just get a policeman in that corner? That's all I want out of the government. Um, secondly, jobs, and jobs in the city, not jobs you have to go out of the city to get. Uh, that's absolutely, absolutely important. And thirdly is uh, schools. We want decent schools for our kids. I mean, very simple wants. I mean, the same thing everybody else wants. Uh, but people in cities don't get those very simple things. And we tried to help them. We had a safe and clean streets bill where we added a lot more policemen at the request of the mayors in, into the cities at state expense. Uh, we, we put a lot of job programs together, including things like the urban enterprise zones, zones to try to attract more business into the city and the cities in one way or another. We had 30 different school reforms, many of them hopefully aimed at people who lived in cities. And you just, but, but you've got to have a policy the state, the governor is going to be battered by all sorts of questions. But at the heart of it is what are you going to do for people in urban areas? What are you going to do for the people who need it the most? And, and, and that's, got to be, that's got to take precedence. That's got to be something you talk about in your state of the state, and your budget message, and, and all of that. And I think, uh, I think it helps a great deal. My, my best policies came from the mayors. And um, working with the mayors, Meeting a we used to meet once a month, or once every two months or something, but a regular meetings, um, regular meetings with people, uh, presence in the cities by state and state government is, is very, very, very important. And I think it's not easy. You have the kind of trends the mayor's talking about have been a long time. Reversing those trends is not going to be easy, but you've got to work on it day after day after day if it's going to happen. And uh, that's what I think, I hope is, uh, the next governor is going to be about. Speak a little bit. I'm, uh, as, as you know, I've been covering education for a long time. Um, and of course, I was going to bring it back to education. I'm a one-trick pony. Um, but um, 
talk about, because there's been a, a pretty sizable investment in, in urban education in the state. It, admittedly, it was kicking and screaming uh, by order of the courts, um, but there certainly has been a lot of money uh, devoted to Newark and Jersey City and, and others. Still a lot of debate of whether that has worked uh, and whether how do you define work anyway. Um, but as we also know now, there is to the point where our, we have a governor who's proposing really pretty much scaling that back entirely. Um, and as much as that isn't really a feasible plan, uh, and I think a lot of folks have said that, it does have some support from folks across the state. Um, speak to the investment, and I'll, I'll start with you because you've lived it, um, the investment and, and how to get past this debate of whether money you know, brings a higher quality education and, and some of those debates, because that's sort of fundamentally at, at issue also in investment in anything. Is it gonna make a difference or are we just putting you know, good money after bad? Ask the, the parents in Milburn if they think money helps their kids get a better education. But the, the reality is what the governor talked about, like all of those programs are being, have been cut or reduced. There will be no, no longer, uh, this is probably the last year for uh, Urban Enterprise Zone. All that stuff is gone. We didn't have it, didn't, haven't even had it long enough for it to bear the kind of fruits that it deserves. Abbott was never fully funded you know, by any governor, Democrat or Republican. They never fully funded Abbott, they never did it. Uh, we're still fighting for them to fund Abbott. The basis of it was that it was unconstitutional to fund uh, schools through property taxes because that is inherently unequal, right? Because obviously when you're in a city where people don't have any property, they don't own anything, the property taxes. Uh, so we have never gone away from the idea of funding schools through property tax. We have to uh, have that debate and discussion in a very real way. Uh, uh, in this state and uh, you know it's, it's difficult to have the discussion uh, and it's easy for the governor to do what he's doing because of because New Jersey is segregated right New Jersey is a segregated state it's segregated by race and class right the the county of Essex is probably uh, extremely segregated right the wealth in the county of Essex is, is is like this you know I was at a, e, e, uh, a thing in Louisville and they were trying to figure out how uh, Newark's uh, rate of folks that go to college is about 17% and the county is at 40 something percent. And I had to let them know that the, that, you know, it's the stark contrast between Newark, Irvington and East Orange and Livingston, Milburn and West Orange, right? So there's a stark contrast there uh, that, that is not addressed and, and it needs to be addressed. Uh, you're gonna pay, we're paying for um, what's happening in education anyway. King talked about that. Uh, uh, in his uh, last book, uh, Chaos or Community, he talked about that, where do we go from here? At the end of the day, uh, if we're not paying it in school, and we're gonna pay it on the back end uh, through uh, crime and jail and uh, social services and other issues. So it's a matter of where you wanna spend your money, not if you're spending the money. So you can scare suburban folks in New Jersey or other folks in New Jersey about spending money, but they're gonna spend it anyway, right? People are gonna spend it either through hospital visits or, or, or incarceration or social services or other kind of programs, or you're gonna spend it on education to make the economy better, to make the cities better, to grow the state of New Jersey, right? And ultimately, hopefully, if you get the, the kind of logic of that is if you put more wealth in people's pockets, if you give them better jobs, they can contribute to the economy, right? Which Gives, allows people to pay more fair share in taxes and not put the burden on very, a very few amount of people to pay the overall tax burden of the state. Uh, but that's not looked at because other things are in the way. You know, the, the, the kind of racism gets in the way, the, the idea, uh, this kind of urbanism uh, a thing gets in the way. We have to really get rid of those kind of concepts and begin talking about the real issues uh, that are stopping people from being able to get a decent education like everyone else. You want to speak to that and the impact of Abbott or not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Abbott did provide a lot of money, so obviously I haven't been there before. Uh, That's true. The, not as much, never was fully funded, but funded to the extent where there was, there was urban students in New Jersey who were getting more than any urban students in the country after the Abbott decision, by far. Uh, I think what you've got to do with, uh, with money, which you need and you've got to have, is tie it to the best science that you have, what makes for a good education. Uh, to, money alone won't do it. 
But if you have money tied, tied to good and well-trained principals, if you have money tied to the best kind of teachers, I mean, and, and, and teachers really benefit. We, we had a program that, again, they let go, but it was a program at Rutgers University where uh, if you were in the top quarter of your class and wanted to go into teaching, and you committed to being in an urban school for at least three years, we paid the tuition to get that great person up into, into schools. Uh, so you've got to have great teachers and well-trained and well, well -trained teachers. Uh, you've also got to have uh, some kind of a measurement. You've got to find out how you're doing each year so you can, you can improve where you're weak. And one that works on individual children. You've got to, and you've got to work with the parents and get the parents into the school. I mean, there are so many things. Right now, the best thing I think we could be doing, uh, I'd like to see the new governor pledge to, is, uh, is preschool education for everybody. I mean, that's the biggest reform I think we can do right now. Uh, but you've got to, and you've got to look at these, because I don't care what they are. I don't care if they're public schools, private schools, charter schools. You ought to concentrate on making sure they're the best they can be and not be satisfied until people are prepared for higher education. Everybody ought to be able to prepare to go on to whatever kind of school it right. is. And if it's not happening, we should find out why and we should hold their feet to the fire. Right. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that at all. I think that that's right. Um, you know, I, I've been in education obviously for 22 years. Um, you know, I, had, I used to look at the USA Today and they would put the top schools in the country on there. And some of them were actually in New Jersey. And I have had, and I had the pleasure of visiting some of those schools as a principal to go figure out, you know, what was going on there. Obviously, that wasn't happening at the school I was at or many of the schools in Newark. And, uh, you know, I had a very frank conversation with a principal there who told me that his teachers were mediocre. His, he was on the top list of the best schools in the nation. He told me that he had mediocre teachers and that at the end of the day, if I took some of his teachers to Newark, they would fail. And, and that the kids were driven uh, primarily by expectations from community and family and other kinds of things. Uh, that existed, and I thought that was uh, very uh, uh, important. Besides the fact they had all kinds of other uh, uh, things, he said the biggest problem they had was uh, uh, fighting with kids for parking their cars in the teacher spaces, <laughs> and um, and going outside to have a cigarette and uh, and coming back in. You know, so they had to argue whether they should spin the kid for smoking a cigarette when the teacher smoked cigarettes. I said, Wow, those are great problems to have. <laughs> but um, at, at the at the end of the day. Uh, the money in, in, in these schools are spent on a variety of different things, and I think that that's what we need to really outline. And a lot of folks uh, you know, are not allowed to see uh, that, we have, that money is spent on, on special education, on, on drug addiction, on, on, on summer, summer school. Like in other communities where people pay for summer school, summer school is paid for uh, uh, in the city because people can't afford to pay it, right? Uh, we, we pay for a, a variety of different things, after-school programs. So all of the money is used to kind of raise the whole child, uh, to deal with the whole child in the community. Piece, pieces that are missing, uh, that are in other people's communities where people are paying for that education out of their pocket, right? So the amount of money that's being spent is probably the same, except the difference is the state is paying some of the money as opposed to somebody's family privately is paying some of that money whether you're talking about uh, a SAT prep class or after school tutorial uh, a, a class or, or somewhere where you send your kid who has special needs and other kind of be or behavioral disorders, all of those things that we foot the bill for uh, because of poverty, uh, other families have to pay for out of their pocket. So if we weighed the amount of money that was actually spent on school or, or a parent who sends their kids who pays $30,000 a year for their kids to go to school to a private school, I mean, uh, tell that parent that they shouldn't throw money at the problem, right? <laughs> they, they, they're sending their kid to Pingree or some other kind of school where they're paying a college tuition for their kid to go to high school because they believe that that's what they should do. That's how they get the best education. Uh, we, we usually have these kind of monetary discussions when we start talking about the city, right, where we are. Like, uh, is it worth us spending this amount of money on these kids here who we may think uh, are going to waste the money or, or is, it can't be used anyway. So we just have to check that, our privilege at the door, uh, when we start talking about black and brown kids and poor kids uh, in these communities, we have to check our privilege, right? Because you're paying for it too, you're just not using the state's money. 
right? So that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, I think the problem is a little deeper uh, than just finances. I, I do agree with that. I think that the, there's a whole segregation of academics uh, in America and, 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 and definitely in New Jersey. There's specific uh, classes and course offerings and opportunities that are offered for kids in other communities that are not offered for our kids uh, here in this city. They have access to different things and opportunities that our kids don't have access to. Uh, we should always think like, you know, why do we need a special kind of education in Newark that other kids don't need in order for us to even be on the same par with everybody else? So we need a whole school reform model, or we need a charter school, or we need this kind of school. So we can't get a regular democratic school like everybody else in America has. We have to have something special, something particular for our kids in these cities where we are. And the question is why? Like somebody asked that question, why? Like either we inherently are having problems learning, which I disagree with, or there's something systemically wrong with a place that says that everybody else can learn based on the, whatever the, the parameters are, but these kids, these kids here, they have to have special things in order for them to learn, right? And we don't wanna deal with that. And, and, and in order to fix the problem, we're gonna have to have the courage to not just talk about it, but to deal, about, to deal with it. Thoughts on that? And it, it, it does speak to this, and we are among the most segregated states in the country, uh, and there's clearly some systemic uh, issues that we're that the mayor is alluding to that I, I think are hard to argue with. Oh yeah. How no, do we? Mayor is absolutely right. How do we get past that? Well, again, I don't want to. You know, the argument that used to be when I was trying to do school reform for the cities was that you know the problems of poverty are so terrible and so debilitating to these, debilitating to these families uh, that you just can't really educate these kids. And that's what teachers unions said, that's what schools said, that's what legislators said. You know, we can't do much because the problems of poverty are so awful. Uh, that is not true and it's never been true. Uh, you can educate any child <laughs> as long as you give them the right opportunity to be educated, as long as you give them decent, uh, decent schools, decent teachers, individual attention, caring of bringing in the families and all that, you do these things that are, and you can educate kids. And I think, man, because of the problems of poverty, you do need a little bit more for some of these kids, and you do need more attention to these kids. That's right. Until you can ri raise them out of poverty, and then they can take care of themselves. And you find out, uh, you know, again, my Pride, probably the best thing I've ever done in government is the Education Opportunity Fund. You look at these kids, they needed help then. They couldn't have done it without the extra help. But now you look at what's happened to them. You find the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, and all say, if I hadn't got that little boost, maybe I wouldn't be here. That's right. So you gotta give them that leg up. But if you give them that leg up, they can compete with anybody. And every single child in this city can be educated and educated as well as anybody else in the country, in my mind. Let me, let me ask, um, you know, you, you mentioned the, the notion of universal preschool and, and we've talked about programs that have been cut um, and EOFs cut. among, you know, a bunch. Um, yet we are going to go into this next year and we already are, are there in a financial abyss in this state um, brought on by a host of factors, pensions and, you know, we can do a long list. Um, resources are not necessarily gonna be flowing out of uh, any, whatever that next administration is. You're both pretty savvy politicians, um, and that's why I brought you up here today. Um, to talk about how politically do we get the will to deal with some of these issues, do we maybe put some off because of some of the, the crisis we're going through? I mean, this is not, you know, we, these are not flush times. Um, and it is going to take some 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 heavy politics. Uh, talk a little bit about the politics of it. Uh, you you guys aren't naive to think that that things are going to just open with a new governor. Talk about how do you address that? I, you're right. I don't I don't I don't believe that. You know, I, um, I just hope that you know that we're not going to go backwards. And all the, what's interesting is all of the programs the governor talked about. The, every last one of those programs have been cut tremendously almost to the point of non-existent, right? So I, I just hope that we don't get to a point where those programs don't exist for, at all and we start from zero, right? That uh, obviously we're not gonna 
get everything we want uh, given the financial times uh, in the state. Uh, you know, hopefully we begin to reverse that with some of uh, and begin to tax some of the, these rich folks in the state you know that the governor refused to do. Uh, begin to get the, the, the money from, from these corporations uh, in the state where the governor uh, give, gave a lot of these folks breaks uh, in, in terms of paying uh, their fair share. So hopefully we get some kind of uh, revenue from, from those areas that begin to at least even things out. But I, I know, uh, you know, I don't expect at least in this term for us to get full funding for all of the things that we're asking for. But I just hope that we don't go backwards and I think it's important for us uh, to begin to have the discussion about gradually opening uh, you know, the spigot up a little bit to allow some money to go back into these areas uh, uh, that have been suffering a long time. And, and I think that those are the things that are necessary to help us turn the economy around, right? Uh, people look at that as, as, as like handouts, I think, but I actually believe, as the governor said, uh, giving people legs up allows them the opportunity to contribute to the economy to allow us to have a, a, a more robust economy than we have now. Uh, as opposed to just wasting money. I think not taxing people their fair share cripples us and it's proven to cripple us, right? So this whole trickle down economics thing has never worked. It, 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 it has done nothing but hurt, it hurt the country and it, and it hurt us here in, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, it's obvious, uh, look at the kind of disrepair uh, that we're in economically uh, because of the lack of investment, because of uh, stopping people from paying their fair share. Uh, uh, in, in this community, in, in, in this state. So hopefully, I think the governor uh, uh, should turn all of those things around ideologically and begin to organize the Democratic Party and make New Jersey a, a true blue state again. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't know what it is at this point. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know, you know whatever the color is when you mix blue and red, I don't know what that comes <laughs> up to be. Maybe it's something else. <laughs> We're also, um, before I turn to the governor on this, uh, We'll have a time for a couple of questions, and the way we're doing it is if you have a question, um, we're doing it by index cards. You'll see some folks in the back and get them to us. We won't have a whole lot of time for that, um, admittedly, because I wanted to get this conversation going, um, but I, I don't want to close that. But your thoughts on, on, on this? I mean, I, well, you know, what, yeah. what is this next governor face in terms of the cities? Well, first of all, you've got to have the cities as a priority. No matter how little or much money you have, it's got to be on the priority list. It, lately, it's been off the priority list, and they've been cutting back things that are important to cities. Uh, all these good Republican programs are going now that, <laughs> that you mentioned. Uh, anyway. I was waiting for that. <laughs> I was waiting for it. But the, the, uh, the governor's obviously, the best thing that happened to the econo this economy is recreation of jobs. We did a lot of these things in the 1980s because we were able to bring three quarters of a million new jobs into the state. But they didn't happen by accident. I mean, we worked on the damn thing. We had, we had offices all over the state, you know, bringing in, bringing in people who, who could bring jobs. And, and we, we, we did things for them, not necessarily tax breaks, but we did things for them to bring them into the state in terms of transportation, a lot of other things they wanted. Uh, you can change the tax structure of the state. But the thing you've got as a state, you know, my rule of thumb was, you can do anything you want with a tax structure, but you can't get it out of line with the neighboring states. Hmm. If uh, I kept the taxes lower than New York's, and I used to talk about it, and Mario Cuomo once, once said to me when we had dinner together in New York, he said, this guy has tilted my state and all the jobs are flowing into New Jersey. Uh, and lower taxes in some areas were, were, were part of that. So, so, so you can do that, uh, but, but, but you've got you to keep the taxes a little, little lower than the neighboring states. Uh, then, but also you keep them fair. They've got to be fair to people. Uh, but setting an urban agenda, you start to ask politics. People in my own party often said, why do you care about this? You know, why, you, why, are you, um, why do you want to do so much time to the cities? And the obvious answer was because it's the right thing to do. But there was a political answer also. When I ran for re-election, Mayor, I carried your city as a Republican. I know. I carried Camden. I carried Jersey City. Um, I carried every city in the state. Because, you know, people in urban areas know if you're doing something for them. 
And they'll cross party lines if, if you are doing something for them and you're the right guy. So there's a political payoff too. If, if you do things for people in cities, they will respond and they will respond electorally. So I think it's the right thing to do. It's also the politically right thing to do. Right. When the next governor is elected, uh, he, he or she may very well invite you, Mayor Baraka, to come speak with them or her. Um, what is the, and, I, and I'm sure you'll take them up on it. Um, what is the number one thing, the first thing you're gonna wanna talk about? Well, the jobs has been my number one issue, right? So jobs and the economy, uh, investment in the, in the city of Newark, uh, uh, training for, for residents, helping them create a pipeline to get out of poverty into college, into careers, into the workforce. I think that's what we need help at uh, the most. Um, ultimately, uh, I think we are on the path to get our schools back, but at the end of the day, I think uh, jobs and economic growth in our, in our city is probably the number one thing uh, in my mind, and I think that we need to kind of re redress all of these issues. What are you asking for from the state in terms of that? Well, uh, many things. One, two. Uh, First thing, though, you're, I mean, when you go in there, what is, you know, this is not going to be a lot, there's not going to be a lot of largesse out of whoever is in that well, office. We, we, we obviously need money, right? So <laughs> we need money to begin to do uh, these specific things. And uh, you know we need money around job training, right? Around workforce investment and, and development. We need uh, a huge sum of money uh, uh, in that way, either through the grants that they get from the federal government that never make their way to the cities, uh, that, that we need that money here. So we're not just talking directly about taxpayer dollars. Uh, we, we, we need that money now. We need it for workforce investment. We need it uh, to be able to tackle uh, the problem that we have of, 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 of maybe 4,000 or so kids that are out of school and out of work. We need money to, to deal with that in the city immediately. And uh, we need money to incentivize a lot of these employers to begin hiring uh, Newark residents and procuring their business uh, from Newark uh, small businesses here in the city. So, uh, it, and, and that's gonna take financial help, technical support, as well as uh, you know a few people showing up in the city, having conversations with some of the CEOs around here to get them to understand that they have to invest in Newark uh, uh, through procurement and through jobs. One of the questions, I'll, I'll stay with you on this one, a couple questions about education, um, the one size fits all model, uh, and we talked about preschool. I know we have some um, public library folks in the room uh, who asked about the role, what is the role do you see of public libraries playing in early childhood literacy? Well, obviously we've already been working with the public library and other uh, entities around here to deal with literacy throughout the, uh, the city. I think the library is extremely important. Uh, when I was a kid, we had a, the library in school, the, li the relationship with the libraries, and I think uh, it is, this administration has tried to help the Newark Public Library with a little bit of resources that we've had, try to you know, give, allow them more resources from the city's coffers as well as other opportunities as well, um, um, and collaborating with them to help us around literacy. Look, it's incredibly important. Most of the people that come to the to Newark Works looking for a job, and they have to take a TAFE test. 60% of those people fail the TAFE test, which is an eighth grade exam. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, literacy is extremely important for us in the city, and I think the Newark Public Library is a, a great partner in helping us achieve our goals. Here's a, a question that we, we're, I think we're gonna end on for both of you. Uh, what role is there for New Jersey residents in a city's agenda? What can the people in this room do to further some of these issues that we're talking about? Well, look, um, first of all, it's a pretty, it's the ones I know of you, a pretty influential audience. Uh, as gubernatorial candidates, and we're listening to you probably more than they listen to other people. Uh, we, by the way, I, shouldn't, I should have mentioned before, we've got one of the great governors right here. That's right. Florio. Governor Florio, yep. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> but you people, uh, are frankly, more influential than most because they'll be talking one-on-one -on -one with some of you. And uh, tell them about this. Tell them, you know, the urban agenda. Tell them about the need for jobs. I mean, this, this is, uh, and, and a governor can do this. You know, you give incentives as governor. Well, part of those incentives can be to do it in the city. Uh, the first bill I was passed in the legislature gave tax breaks to a, to a business, but only if they built their building on Broad Street. Right. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have gotten the tax incentives. Uh, 
so you can direct things, even without a lot of dollars, you can direct things into the city rather than, uh, rather than other places. And all the kind of programs we've been talking about, some of the ones that are still good, that are running out of money because they're not a priority in the budget anymore, get them back into the budget as a priority. And, and, um, but, but I think the idea is get an urban agenda, care about it as a candidate and as a governor, come to the cities, demonstrate their importance, talk about them in your state of the state, make them part of your policy agenda, and as you build that agenda, work with the mayors. They know best what's going on in their own cities. A few words. Got a good audience here. Yeah. So um, we involve the I'll residents and, and the folks in this room. I would, I would concur with the governor, but you know, I, I would hope that everybody's a part of some uh, kind of organization or institution that uh, has a, a level of influence on the community and elected officials around the state uh, that use their, their, their authority, their influence, and their power to sway, uh, as was stated, the administration and the government, the legislators, everyone, to move towards uh, what we're talking about, our urban agenda, to begin to invest uh, in these communities, invest in school, uh, invest in infrastructure, right? The infrastructure investment is huge. Uh, uh, that, that needs to happen. That will benefit, and 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 why they invest in infrastructure to make sure that local people are benefiting from the infrastructure investment. That they're training them and that they're getting the jobs uh, because of infrastructure growth. Uh, that's incredibly important. And that when we start having these conversations about our taxes across the state of New Jersey, that we keep a, a, a open mind about what's happening. Uh, in this state and around the country and about what you're paying for, right? And, and, and not allow uh, these kind of backward uh, revisionists to, uh, to separate us uh, by, by saying uh, the, we can't fund schools in Newark uh, uh, because uh, we, the people in the suburbs, don't want to give the money, right? So you don't want to allow these people to create the kind of division around class and race that they've always used uh, to keep uh, progressive people separated uh, in this state and in this country that we have to understand uh, in order for New Jersey to get to a place where we need it to be, that we're all in it together. All right. Can I say one th final thing? Sure, of course. Look, we talked about jobs. As a governor, I think Jim would agree, if we can turn around our cities, first of all, we'll never be a great state unless we do that. If we can turn around our cities and make them an engine of economic progress, not in any way a drain, that will do more to help the state, to help the state's budget, to help everything else, and anything else we could be doing. I mean, there's a real economic payoff to working on an urban agenda with the cities, and, and uh, hopefully our leadership in the future will see that. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you both. These <laughs> two had spoken on a stage together on these issues, so uh, this was a, a first time for all of us, and I think it was a great discussion. Thank you so much for being here. We have, like, no time till the next session, so no <laughs> lollygagging. Go to them, and thank you all very much.